Hi everyone, you're listening to Bush Tech, an ag tech podcast that gets to the so what of ag tech. We'll bring you interesting things from interesting people, and I'm one of your co-hosts, Simon Matthewson. And I'm your other co-host, Sarah Nolette. On this podcast, we will bring in leading speakers in technology, entrepreneurship, investment, agriculture, science, and anything else you can think of and we can find in the world of ag tech. We'll look to demystify it so that we're getting to the so what. What does it really mean for farmers and for the broader agricultural industry? I'm farming and I grow it. I'm farming and I grow it. So welcome to the podcast, Sam Marwood. Uh, you Let me see if I can do a good job of summarizing your background here. You can tell me what I get wrong. Um, but grew up on a, a dairy farm and then studied environmental science uh, at uni, worked in government, and then left to become a social entrepreneur. I've uh, started a few companies uh, to help people and animals and the environment. And now, and, and how I know you, is as CEO of Cultivate Farms. Uh, a, another social enterprise, um, but, but for-profit company with an ambitious vision to help aspiring farmers find farms and, and start farming. Uh, it, what did I what did I miss? It's an impressive background there, and we're super excited to have you on the podcast. But how'd I do in summarizing? That is an excellent summary, Sarah, and thank you for having me, and, and thank you, Simon, as well. I'm excited to uh, be on your podcast. I think what you're doing is a brilliant thing. Thanks, Sam. So I wanted to start maybe in, in asking you what it was like quitting your job. I mean, it's not – people sort of romanticize entrepreneurship and especially social entrepreneurship, sort of doing good for the world. But what was it actually like for you to, to make that jump and kind of start down this path? Um, it was definitely uh, scary. Uh, the main thing was figuring out budgets. Um, so I had a well-paid, um, secure – government job that I could have kept for the rest of my life um, but I, I remember getting home from work one day and I don't think I slammed the door completely but I just definitely closed it uh, faster than I normally would and I was frustrated with um, not being able to implement my own idea so I sat down with my wife because I was sitting out if we moved uh, and we moved in with parents um, but if we did that we could have a crack at starting um, this Coldway Farms idea so um, it was born out of just a desire to, to make a change, and I, I, um, I, I just want to have a life out anymore to find solutions. I have the idea of social enterprises or businesses um, getting out there and having a crack at solving problems, and that's what we're trying to do with Cultivate Farms. So, do you have the, uh, the idea of Cultivate Farms in your head for, for a long time, or had you been setting up for years, or when you decided to? Uh, I. Yeah, it's interesting. I think it was, it was probably when I was growing up on the dairy farm that the the idea was always sitting there ready to be unpacked. But um, I, I wanted to be a, a farmer, and but then I still remember that crushing day when Aaron's dad told me I wasn't getting the farm, and I'm one of these kids, so there was no chance anyway that I'd get the farm. But they had to sell up because um, they, all their assets, were, all the money was locked into the land. So they always said, we're going to be selling so we can retire. So I remember at eight... I remember about eight that I knew I wouldn't be a farmer. Um, and then uh, I went off and did the environmental science and worked in government. And it wasn't until um, a good friend, Tim Hicks, who's now the co founder, uh, who's a frustrated wannabe farmer, we were just talking one day that he said, Oh, all I want to do is be a farmer. And I, I can't. I don't have the money. I'm not a millionaire. And he said, What if there was a business that bought farms for young people? And it was that point I went back to being eight years old. and um, my mind just went off and for the last three years now we've been trying to figure out what is a what is a business that we can set up that, that does that very thing. It, it eliminates the barrier uh, to entry for farm ownership, um, which is which is money. Um, and we think we've got some neat solutions now. So how does it actually work? I mean, I know a bit about the business. You and I know each other through a couple of different kind of pathways, most recently in, in actually working on the business a bit. But for, for Simon and for the audience, can you tell us a bit about how Cultivate works and, and sort of where it's at now? Yeah, so we're a matchmaking service. Uh, we did think about calling ourselves eFarmony, but knew that that would be too corny. So we stuck no, <laughs> with Cultivate that. Farms. I, I did notice. Sorry, I just want to jump in there. I did notice you said you're the Tinder of the of the 
of the, the, the farming world or something. That's one of your taglines on yeah, your web, website. So you still kind of kept with it. You just updated the, the reference. We're, yeah, we're not sure whether you're, we're supposed to use those sort of taglines or not. It's a, I think it's a good way to quickly get people head around what we're doing. But uh, yeah, we're a matchmaking service. Um, and uh, it's, the idea is, is really about connecting three, three parties. Uh, around farm ownership, so aspiring farmer, a retiring farmer, and investors. Uh, so an aspiring farmer is someone who has the skills and energy and passion to to own and, and run a farm, and they they just desperate to own their own bit of dirt, uh, but don't have the the capital to buy the farm themselves, or, or can't even uh, get the debt required to do that. Um, then there's a retiring farmer, so someone who is looking to step back, but um, maybe retain some ownership still of the farm. Uh, Maybe their, their kids aren't ready to take on the farm or they don't have kids to hand the farm on to. So we love the idea that they could hand on the farm to uh, someone else's kids who would just love it just as much as they do. Uh, and the third being investors. So there's lots of people out there who want to buy farms. So we're usually talking high net worth individuals, but we're trying to get the discussion going uh, to get more people to be investors in farms. So uh, mum and dad investors, retired farmers, uh, who have uh, money in the bank looking to invest in and they can invest that into the local community um, and crowdfunding is definitely an area we're looking into as well. So we're just trying to find, get these conversations going between these three parties um, to find the best people and we start with, convers- with with the connections first. So we want to get the right people having a conversation and once we've got the right people, we know it's just a matter of um, being creative with accountants and lawyers um, to find the best farm ownership uh, solution for them. Yeah, really cool, Tim. So I, I can see the value for the aspiring farmers who don't, <clears throat> excuse me, who don't really know how to go on this path or, or where to start and the sort of tools and, and connections you could help them with. But for the investors, what's the value proposition for them? Why are investors excited to, to get involved? So they have money to spend. So they're looking to invest into good farm opportunities. And so if you if they go onto realestate.com.au, then they've still got to go through the whole process of figuring out whether this farm can generate income and who's going to run it, um, and, uh, how is it all going to work. And what we're saying is that um, with our aspiring farmers, uh, we are getting them to pitch farms um, to investors. So we're saying to investors, you sign up and you will have a regular flow of deals uh, in your inbox uh, from very clever and passionate farmers from all over Australia that will meet your investment requirements. So that's our, that's our aim with investors and we're starting to build that at the moment. But um, we're trying to do that. We're, we're trying to inspire the next generation of farmers to say, don't just sit around complaining that you don't own a farm or you don't have the money. The, uh, the power is now in your hands. If you think you're clever enough and, and good enough, get out there and find farms, find them off real estate uh, websites or Let's get them off retiring farmers and and pitch them. Let's get them in front of investors who are who are ready to to invest. And again, this isn't just high net worth individuals. This is, uh, this could be crowdfunding or people in the city looking to reconnect back to the bush. So, um, yeah, I think from an investor point of view, we, we hope we'll be that first point of call for them uh, for finding great farm investment opportunities. That's awesome, Tim. I love the talk about sort of hope, and I love the call to action to sort of you know. I don't know get off the couch or, or sort of get, get looking for the opportunities. <laughs> One thing I really like about what you've done is, is the marketing and how like the Facebook live updates and really being out there talking about this and being, uh, you know, an emotional connection to the aspiring farmers and to the investment community as well. And, and talking about some tough issues in a pretty public way. What has that been like for you both in terms of kind of developing a bit of a marketing strategy, but also just putting yourself out there like that? I was so nervous setting up our Facebook page, um, would have been a year or so ago, uh, and now I can't get enough of creating content and getting uh, and my face and Tim and Teague and the co-founders face out there that um, I just didn't realise starting up Coldweight Farms, the power of social media. Uh, everyone is on their phone um, probably half the hours of the day and uh, half of that time on your phone is on, on social media and realize there is no more uh, barriers to you getting to your audience anymore. You don't have to get articles in a newspaper or on TV. Um, you can create content on things like Facebook Live and it be people's um, faces straight away. So I, 
I've been um, inspired by an entrepreneur called Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, people may have heard of him. He's a, he's a crazy American uh, entrepreneur and he just has so many great ideas around the need to create content and create a personal brand and a brand and, and the power of social media, Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat um, to get your message out. So after listening to him, and I, uh, pretty much daily I listen to him still just to inspire me that um, we I need to get out there and, and create content. And, and I have created so many great networks through doing uh, our updates on, on Facebook Live. And we have our aspiring farmers. When we meet up in person, they say, like, we, we feel like we're friends uh, because we our aim is to document our journey. So every week on Facebook Live, we, we talk about what's happened in the past week and and do these sort of calls to action and let aspiring farmers and retiring farmers know uh, of the opportunities and, and get them inspired. So I, I can't emphasize enough how important I think social media is uh, and it's free and it's available to anyone. Uh, and I, I think business in general has really caught on to the, to the need to, to be creating that content on that platform. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because uh, one of our other guests, um, I think Kevin Bob from AgriWeb was talking about how there's this perception that all oh, you know farmers aren't on social media or agriculture is not on social media, and it just couldn't be further from the truth. As as you found uh, that that you're really able to reach and not only reach but connect with this audience in a way that's not just push your ad or put something in a newspaper, but start a conversation and have them get to know. <clears throat> excuse me, have them get to know really who who you are and and what you stand for, which I think is so cool. Have you have you found that it's just the young generation or just the aspiring farmers sort of younger people that are engaging on social media or is it effective for reaching retiring farmers or other ages of of farmers as well well i I think if you go to any family function um you can see that every generation is on social media um you know there's a silent you can see that mums and dads and even grandparents and the kids everyone's on their phone uh and it doesn't matter if you're in the city or the country i think uh it's quite self-evident and everyone knows it um, and everyone sees it every day, um, but they may not have realised that power that's associated with that. So people's attention is on their phone, and people's attention then is social media, Facebook or Instagram. Um, and if you want their attention, you've got to create content where they are. And uh, I think this, that I think it helps to get radio and TV. That's where people's attention was, and that's creating content there was was fantastic. But now the attention has shifted and so we've just got to change where we create our content uh, and I don't think there's any difference between the city and the country in terms of um, uh, uh, use of, of social media so yeah de- definitely think um, if, if people uh, are questioning whether um, creating content on social media is is a necessary thing I think they um, should just look around and see that they definitely should be. Yeah, when, when, that's awesome, Sam. And and you have like 4,000 followers on Facebook and looks like some really good engagement uh, and, and building a bit of a community. So that's really exciting to see. One thing that gets talked about a lot as well in the kind of entrepreneurial community is is failure and sort of mistakes and, and learning from them. Do you have a, a failure or a, a mistake that you can share and, and sort of what you learn from it? Probably the biggest was thinking I'd have this business up and running and, and making money in six months. <laughs> and then I realized that um, it's, it's six years is, is the, probably the time that you need to be able to get something uh, up and running and off the ground. It's, um, uh, it's hard work starting a, biz- a business and especially something that um, in a way we're creating this whole new concept and we're then so we're trying to create it and sell it and um, make it work uh, so it feels on our angle even doubly as hard and um, so yeah I think the, our, our biggest mistake was was a, a mindset that this would be you know, relatively straightforward to, to set up and, and get going but over time we've realized that um, no it just requires persistence and you just got to believe in it and we just got to have something that keeps us getting up every morning um, and I think that's our 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 vision and our plan, which is to get hundreds of young people back into onto farms across the country. Um, so that's the stuff that keeps us going. We know we've got many years still ahead before we really even get the traction that we we want. Um, so uh, yeah, I encourage anyone 
I encourage anyone who's got an idea uh, and a business they want to start off is to keep working in their full-time job and work between 5 5 p.m. and midnight um, to get your idea off the ground and your, use your spare time and make, get the business up and running first before you, you take the leap. So I think I leapt too early. Yeah, that's such a a useful tip. There's so much romanticism around like quit your job and start a company and that's just not practical or often smart for for many people. Um, I I think it would be interesting to know how you've kind of made it work given that the journey is a bit longer than you thought it would be. Did you pick back up some part-time work? Have you like, how have you made that work and still been clearly as committed to the, the business as you are? Long service leave, so I had um, I think about three months, and I spread that out over twelve months. Uh, so, and I also realised you either make money or cut back all your costs. So that's why we moved in with my in-laws, um, which has been amazing. I don't think we we couldn't have done this without being able to do that. And I uh, I think there's a there's a lot of people my age in the early thirties who actually are living back with their parents, which um, is probably another discussion. But um, that was a big thing for me, and then. Uh, probably about a year and a half in, um, I had uh, the need to yeah make an income, um, and I was thinking about getting part time work, uh, but I always wanted to have it in a related industry or something that could really align with what we're doing with Cultivate Farm, so I didn't have to um, uh, divide my energy and divide my time. And um, luckily enough, I've uh, I've met an, an investor, an impact investor who loves agriculture and loves the environment and he has been a massive supporter of ours and so I've been able to work with him and uh, and support his programs which are completely aligned with what we're doing with Cultivate Farms um, and so that's just been able that the, the other thing that's, that's able to keep, keep this going is we've I've got an income on the side which allows us to, to keep Cultivate going along which is absolutely massive and um, uh yeah, and, and I think over this year, 2018, uh, for us is going to be the year where we actually are going to start generating income and be able to support ourselves. So uh, exciting times ahead. That's fantastic, Jim. Uh, really exciting. Uh, on the kind of investor side, I guess more for the business, have you tried to raise some, some money or get some financial support in terms of, you know, an equity stake or otherwise in the business? That's obviously talked about a lot, you know, fundraising and venture-backed companies in, in ag tech now and, and the you know possibilities there. What has your journey been like in terms of, of trying to attract investment? Yeah, again, I remember the early days, that was always our plan, that we would um, have this amazing idea and then just head out and get investors to back us. But um, I don't know. I think over time we've realized what we want to do is develop a business that makes money and that serves people and is useful and, and can stand on its own feet. And so we we have no interest now in um, seeking you know, investors to to back our enterprise. We feel that we can generate the income through our network of, of followers and our aspiring farmers. So we have a membership um, base and um, people sign up to have the opportunity to get in front of investors to buy their farm. Um, and I also think we love the idea that we can keep full control of our business um, by not um, seeking investors uh, to, to get this going. So. Um, it's been something we've been thinking about for a long time, but we're, we'd love to just be able to keep things moving along um, and, and and build a business that can um, stand on its own two feet uh, and build it organically uh, rather than um, go too big too soon. And maybe in maybe in five years' time, and, and we think about expanding worldwide or, or something like that, we'd, we'd probably look at um, raising capital. But uh, I think we're pretty content just to, to build something from the ground up, build our audience, um, demonstrate what we're doing is great and, and see where it takes us. Yeah, really exciting, Sam. I think there is a lot of sort of pressure almost to raise money and, and kind of scale, uh, but, you know, it sometimes makes a lot more sense to 
kind of start slower and, and build slower. Um, at the same time, like you said, this is a problem that's facing farmers in all kinds of countries. So if you can find a business model that, that helps solve it, then there is really an opportunity to expand overseas, I think, which is, which is really cool. A bunch of data just came out in the U.S. about – uh, you know, inability for young farmers to get on the land and how finance is such an issue. So it, it is a really massive problem. I, I wanted to ask also about the kind of balance between being a social entrepreneur, having this clear social or impact mission with building a for-profit company. Is Do you get mistaken for, oh, this is just a nonprofit thing or he's looking for, you know, handouts or did you think about being a, a nonprofit? Like, how do you balance the kind of doing good and, and doing well aspects of the business? Yeah, it is a, a tricky one. Um, I, I guess for everything we do, it, it, it does come back to our core driver, which is to rejuvenate regional communities. And I guess that's how we have structured our business from there. We've, we've figured out well, what are the legal entities we need to reflect that vision. We didn't want to be driven by the legal entities in a way. We didn't want to say, we're here to do good. How do we structure this so we can? And our, our business structure is we have a hybrid model of a not-for-profit and a for-profit working in, in tandem. Um, um, but we do, there are some people who know we're a social enterprise and probably a lot that don't. Uh, and I guess there's a big discussion around what a social enterprise is anyway. Um, but one, one point I've had reflected a couple of times from the investors angle is, uh, or people ask, oh, so you're, you're after farms, you're after investors just to give a handout to support young people who probably can't be very profitable uh, in, in running their farms. And I just I pull them up straight away and I say, no, this is not about handouts or charity. Uh, we are finding the very best people um, to run farms and own farms across the country uh, who are going to make uh, very good profits with their farms and run them really well. Um, it's just that we want, we're doing this because we want to get those people into the bush. We don't want these. We, we, we will fail if we are putting young people on farms uh, who don't know how to run farms or don't know how to make them profitable. Um, so we, I guess that's the that's the messaging we've got to get right, that we're doing this for good reasons, but we're not doing this as a handout for, for young people. You know, we're just making it easier for them to find the right people so they can get on and, and farm. And in that way, we can um, rejuvenate regional communities by getting those young people back. So it's a yeah, really interesting question and... and um, yeah, it's something we just need to keep refining our messaging around. But um, yeah, we've got a, a, a bigger purpose, but this is a, a still a commercial, um, commercially focused uh, enterprise that we're trying to set set up across the country. So, so just on that, Sam, how do you yeah. how do you evaluate the um, the the farm uh, the, the young farmer for the investor? Like, how, what's what's the evaluation process to if you're, if you're going to put up the best and brightest, how do you determine that they're the best and brightest, especially if they're potentially not running their own farm at the moment? Yeah, and another great question, one we get asked a lot as well. And um, people have said to us, "Oh, well, you need to you need to filter and you need to guarantee that they are the, the best people and the best farmers." And and then and also on the other angle, it's you know, young people saying, "Well, who are the investors, and how do I make sure I've got the the right investors, or how much return do they want?" And um, so we've realised that if we create a marketplace, we don't have to be the one policing or controlling who applies for farms or pitches farms or who invests in farms. And who knows why uh, someone might want to invest in farm and why they might want to back a certain person. So we're leaving it up to the market to decide that. So we're saying to aspiring farmers, if you, you think you're good enough, it's up to you to document in this pitch um, your skills um, and how you're going to run a, a farm and how you're going to make it profitable. And, and make sure you show you've got the right people around you to um, prove that you are uh, as good as you say you are. Uh, and then we leave it up to the investors to to chase up um, whether that, in fact, is the case. Um, so we, I guess, through our, our pitching template, which people can and download off the website, and we'll have that as a marketplace, uh, an online uh, system very soon. Um, but we, I guess, we're guiding these aspiring farmers um, for them to do their own uh, pitch around why they're the best and I think and we're, we're reviewing all these pitches as well but I think we'll easily identify those farmers who don't quite have the skills and that's another aspect of what we're doing is if you're not farm ready we want to point you in the right direction so you can be or go go get a, a farm job or 
go to a TAFE or uni or um, do or do whatever you need to to get your skills up so that in a couple of years' time you actually are farm ready. Um, so I hope that's answered a bit of an, a roundabout way. I no, no. We don't want to meddle. We want yeah. people to, to pitch it themselves now. Yeah. And, and it kind of shows the drive and the commitment of, you know, based on what the pitch is as well on, on, on both ways, on both sides. Oh, I think it's a really interesting a- Absolutely. Concept. And I think, yeah, exactly. And, and as you read these pitches, you can for them you realize who really is um uh, and and clever and 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 the people who aren't probably don't have the skills or um, are struggling to present a great farm opportunity and it it becomes pretty self-evident and through that we'll be able to point people in the right direction of no no you need to go off and learn more or or, um build your skills so hopefully it's a a great way to to filter people and and get them through their own self-learning absolutely because i think i mean a lot of the investment uh, is is a lot of in the people, you know. It's the business is the business, but it's it's the people that drive it, which kind of drive the decisions from an investment point of view. Like you believe in the people, and that's why you do it, right? You know they'll make it a success. Yeah, great. Absolutely, yeah. People talk, and not even in the farming world, but any business. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love discussions about people say that the jockey horse the discussion is exactly the same with farming. I'm curious, Simon. You work with uh, a lot of investors. Do you like do any? Do you have any feedback for for Sam about um, about how this could work better, or what maybe the investors you work with would would like to to see? Maybe a great uh, tip or, or person to give Sam some advice here as he continues to refine and sure. cultivate. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, it's it's a it's a that's a long, much longer conversation. But I suppose you know, if you're from an investor's point of view, like um, their their view is. There is return, obviously, and as I said, they're investing in you know the people. I think it's very important, but a lot of it is around kind of the governance and, and the and the, the risk management aspect of it. So if they're going to donate a long a lot of money, it doesn't doesn't matter what they're investing in, but if they're going to um, invest their money, particularly if it's it's personal income, they want to know that um that it will be uh, there's the right governance principles around it to ensure that that investment will be looked after i suppose so you know at the end of the day i think one of the big changes and we've talked about this before kind of the, in the farming community is you know that it has to be run like a company it, and it's difficult with a family business because um family businesses don't necessarily have the same structure as a company you know the board table is the kitchen table and i get that but when you've got an external investor potentially they would want to understand that there is a board meeting every year and it's minuted and they know that's ha- happening. And it's just different nuances, right? I think you just got to look at it from, you know, investor's point of view and from a farmer's point of view and just go, well, where, where's that, where does that marry in the middle? Hurl of wisdom, if you probably already know, or, or, or well all over that sound. So it's just uh, I think that's absolutely right. And these, so this is part of the education that we want to provide to these farmers is that this, this is a, you're running a professional business here and you need to have governance, you need to have a board, you need to be accountable, um, you need to have plans and you need to be reporting back. And um, We're working through this right now around developing templates for all these requirements so that these aspiring farmers know what they're getting uh, um, as part of their, these arrangements and also give the confidence to investors that, um, that they're going to have farmers who are committed to, to being accountable. I think it's absolutely key and um, we're definitely open to suggestions on how to make that better, and um, but it is a little bit of a different way to think about farming um, than the traditional uh, farming uh, operations. But I think it's a it's a what we need to do if we want to find new ways of getting capital, and especially for an aspiring farmer, if, if they don't have the money, they're going to have to find the money from investors. And, uh, these are just the checks and balances that are going to be part and parcel of, of running a farm in the future. Awesome, Tim. So, our last question, maybe for me, if I'm a, either an aspiring or a retiring farmer uh, listening to, to the podcast here, or curious about what you're up to and how I can learn more and, and how I can get started, what should I do first, and, and where can I find out more about about cultivate and how you can help me? First, I would uh, encourage you to think about what you really want in life. Do you really want to be a farmer? Um, is it something you wake up uh, thinking about every single day? And if it is, uh, then I encourage you to, to go jump on our website and uh, have a play around and think, well, yeah, I do want to be a farmer And for, uh, if you're an aspiring farmer and download our 
farm teaching template and have a look at what you need to do to be able to uh, convince someone to back you onto a farm that you would love to, to run. Um, and then if you're a re- retiring farmer, it's just think about um, what is your legacy? What is your farming legacy that you want? Do you have, uh, maybe you don't have kids to hand the farm over to, but you love the idea that you can still be a part of the farming operation. So we'd, we'd love to have a chat and that's mainly what we do is have conversations around um, what, what you want for your, for your farm and for your future. So if you're an aspiring farmer, jump on and get the template. If you're a retiring farmer, uh, give us a call um, or, or um, have a chat to your accountants or, or lawyers or advisors and, and have a chat to them about what um, options could be available for you for your, for your farming future as well. Awesome. Sam, thank you so much. Really practical advice uh, and, and a really helpful and, and inspiring vision that you have uh, and, and story that you've, uh, journey that you've gone on to bring this to life. So thank you so much for sharing it with us today and uh, best of luck with uh, getting this off the ground and profitable this year. Really exciting year for you guys and look forward to hearing how it goes. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Sam. That's a joyful conversation. Thank you for listening to the Bush Tech Podcast. We'd love to hear what you think. If you have feedback, suggestions for future guests or oh, technologies man, or topics yeah, you want us to cover, you can find us at bushtechpodcast.com.au. I hope you found it enjoyable. Oh, man, Until yeah, next time, see ya. See ya.